uh, a little bit of, about Shakespeare's background, just um, a couple of points. In In 1575, James Burbage built a playhouse or a building solely for the purpose of play acting. Okay? And he gave it the original name of the theater. Um, he built it on a plot of land northeast London, actually outside. Uh, the city wall of London at that point, and he leased the land that it was on. So he leased the land, he built a building. In 1598, 50, excuse me, 1599, that lease was up. Okay. So he owned the building, but he didn't own the land upon which the building was built. So when the lease was up, he either had to re-lease the land or Lose the building. Not actually him at that point. It, it was his uh, son and the people who were using the building, which was the Lord Chamberlain's men. It was Shakespeare's acting company. Okay. So in 1599, probably his son, Richard, came up with the bright idea of, well, we'll just take it apart and move it. So they moved it from the area of Shoreditch, London, to south of the River Thames in the area called Southwark. The reason they moved it south of the river, south of the River Thames was because then the mayor of London had no reach. He had no control. When, when the playhouses in London were closed in the mid-1590s, all of them were closed. If the Lord Mayor wanted to close the playhouses in London again, he could. He couldn't close the globe and the other few playhouses that were south of the Thames because that wasn't in the London city limits. Okay? So it's then that that building gets its name, the Globe. Okay? 1613, the King's Men, still Shakespeare's company. Shakespeare's probably not there anymore. He's probably already back in Stratford because he leaves around 1611, 1612. But in 1613, in June of 1613, they are putting on a production of Henry VIII. And the production calls for cannon fire. Okay? So they don't actually launch cannon balls. They're firing blanks. But the blanks still incorporate wadding. And the wadding blasts out of the cannon, lands on the thatched roof, burns the globe to the ground in a matter of two or three hours. Okay? And that's, there is no globe from that point on until 15, uh, 1995, okay? Uh, late, 50, late 1980s, uh, an American producer, screenwriter, director named Sam Wanamaker comes up with the bright idea of rebuilding Shakespeare's globe. I mean, he's living in London. He's like, what gives? I mean, the greatest playwright in the English language, and we, we don't have a reproduction globe. So he raises the funds and starts the process of rebuilding the Globe Theater. In the process, the foundations of the original Globe Theater are discovered. Not at the site where the, if you go to London today and go to Shakespeare's Globe, it's not the same location. Shakespeare's Globe, the theater that exists today, stands about 400 yards west of the original one. The original one was discovered when they were doing some renovations on an apartment building, renovations in the, in the foundation of the apartment building, and they found the foundations of Shakespeare's original Globe. But if you go to the Globe today, it's built all out of the exact same materials, exact, exact same dimensions, and everything. Okay? Um, and then the last thing, 1623, the first folio is published. The first folio is the first collected edition of all of Shakespeare's plays. Okay. 
Okay? Prior to 1623, about half of Shakespeare's plays have been published. So it's our, it's our sole source for about half of all of the plays. Um, published by friends of his who are also fellow actors in both the Lord Chamberlain's men and the King's men with Shakespeare. Um, got a copy of it in my office, not a copy, a facsimile, a reprint. Scans about yay tall, about that wide, and about that thick. I mean, it's massive, right? Very expensive to publish, very expensive to buy at the time. Um, it was pretty important in Shakespeare's day. If you were to find, rummage around, I don't know, in a bookstore or whatever, an original first edition of the first folio, 1623, and put it up for <clears throat> put it up for auction, it'd be worth millions. And there aren't, as far as we know, there aren't any left in the wild, so to speak. Um, most of them were bought up in the late 19th, early 20th century by a railroad tycoon by the last name of Folger. If you go to Washington, D.C. today, you can visit the, Shul the Folger Shakespeare Library and see most of them. But there are first uh, there are first folios in you know other libraries. New York Public Library has one. Um, Library of Congress has one. Bodleian has more than one. Cambridge University Library has I'm pretty sure more than one. The British Library has uh, a few. But the Folger has, if I remember right, it's like twenty or so. And these are again hugely expensive. All right. All right. Enough with the background. Let's jump into A Midsummer Night's Dream. What kind of play is this? It's a comedy. A specific kind of comedy? Romantic comedy. All I was look, looking for on the quiz, though, is, is um, comedy. Okay? So, the play begins... <clears throat> And it begins with Duke Theseus, and it is set in Athens. Okay? When? We talked about the first day of class, you know, setting. Setting can be location. Setting can be time. Setting can be cultural atmosphere. So what's the time setting of this? Well, the fact that Theseus is Duke, and he's marrying Hippolyta, queen of the Amazons, gives us the time frame. It's mythological. We're, we're like, not quite Trojan War, because that's pre this, um, but, but we're long, long before Plato and Socrates and all those guys in the 5th century. We're probably before Homer, Homer, if he really existed, around the 8th century, the 800s BC, Trojan War is about 12, 1300 BC. Mm -hmm. Probably somewhere between there, between 800 and 1200 uh, BC, okay? Because Theseus is a mythological character. So we're at his court, and the play opens up, and we're told in the opening five lines what is going to happen in four days' time? A wedding. Whose wedding? Theseus and Hippolytus, okay? How'd they meet? He defeated her in a war. Okay, she's queen of the Amazons. How many of you seen, you know, at least Wonder Woman? Wonder Woman is an Amazon. What, um, what was peculiar about Amazonian, Amazonian, I never know how to pronounce that word, society? Matriarchal. It's a society of women. What was men's place in Amazon society? Slaves, servants, sperm donors. Also, I mean, in order to keep the society going. Men had no standing. What was women's position in Greek society? Just the opposite. <laughs> the women had no position. 
The women had no standing. The women kept the race going through childbirth, okay? But they had no voice, they had no say, etc. So Theseus is marrying her because he says, line 16, after he tells Philostrate to go stir the Athenian youth, that is, have them come up with some revels for our um, wedding evening festivities and such. He says, Hippolyta, I wooed thee with my sword. Wooed. It's an old-fashioned term to refer to another old-fashioned term. Courting. Okay? How did he woo her? He beat her in battle. How do we know he actually beat her? And won thy love doing the injuries. He physically harmed her. Now, maybe this is some weird thing going on in, you know, Hippolyta's mindset, where he beats the snot out of her, and she's turned on by that. But it's the fact is, he defeats her in battle. And therefore, she agrees to marry him. Whether it's romantic or it's spoils of war, we're not really quite sure. Okay? So he says, but I will wed thee in another key. That is, I'm not going to marry you kind of in battle. No. They're going to get married with pomp, with triumph, and with reveling. This is kind of what implies the relationship they now have is a romantic one. She's not being forced into this, in other words. Okay? So, after that, immediately comes in Aegeus. A local high-ranking member of society. And he brings in two people with him. His daughter, Hermia. And another man, or a man named Demetrius. And says to Theseus, He, Demetrius, has my permission to marry my daughter, Hermia. Okay? And then he brings in another man, Lysander. It says, but this man hath bewitched the bosom of my daughter. Bewitched. What does that usually mean? Well, what does it literally mean? It's like you put a spell on her. The bosom of my child. He's not talking about her breasts. He's talking about what? Her heart. He has stolen her heart. Okay? How? He's given her rhymes. He's given her love tokens. He sung outside her window at night. All of which are things that we see in another play by Shakespeare. It's not a comedy. Romeo and Juliet. Romeo does all those things for Juliet. But that's a tragedy. Why? Because that love doesn't end happily like the loves will in this one. All right? So, he goes on and says, And my gracious dude, be it so, she will not hear before your grace consent to marry with Demetrius. I beg the ancient privilege of Athens, which is what? If she is mine, I may dispose of her, which shall be, that is, he will dispose of her. We think of dispose as meaning Get rid of. It's not what it means. It's give away like in the modern Protestant wedding ceremony where the father gives away the bride, so to speak. Okay? That's what he means. He's going to give her away one of two ways, either to Demetrius or to death. She marries him or she dies. Okay? So notice Theseus doesn't just automatically rubber stamp with these what Aegeus said. No, he turns to her and says, well, what, what do you say? Be advised. Your father should be as a god to you. As a god. Greek pantheon of gods. What does he mean? You should do whatever he wants. Greek myth and such. What happens when humans don't follow the will of the gods? Bad stuff. Always. Okay? So, 
He says, Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. And Demetrius and Lysander, I think at least, based upon what Shakespeare writes in the play, ought to be similar stature, similar build, almost even similar looks. I used in my first class, kind of the, they ought to use Chris and, and Liam Hensworth. Chris for one of them and Liam for the other. I don't care which one you choose. Okay. Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. Yeah, so is Lysander, Hermes says. Well, Theseus, yeah, you're right, he is. In himself, that is, objectively looking at him, yes, he is. But, but here means except. Except in this kind, that is, except in this nature, he lacks something. What does he lack? Your father's voice. He doesn't have your father's assent, your father's approval. Therefore, Demetrius must be held worthier. Hermia, I would that my father look but with my eyes. Meaning, I wish my father looked at Lysander the way I looked at him. Well, that's kind of dangerous if you think about it. Because if you take that literally, what does that mean? I wish my father loved, erotically, romantically, Lysander. Which we're going to hear Lysander kind of reply on later. Or add to, maybe, later. Theseus, rather, your eyes must with his judgment look. In other words, your eyes must do what? Not look through your passion, but through his reason. Okay? You've got to see him the way your father sees him. Now, one of the themes in this play is seeing. And how we see... And what is a result of how we see? Because how we see something can affect how we understand that. We're going to hear one of the characters say in a few moments, you know, that we can look at something that other people will think of as being base and vile, and we can look at it and see it as something high and noble, lofty and beautiful. So, Hermia, she said, I, I, I'm sorry, but tell me, what's the worst I can expect? If I don't agree to marry Demetrius, what's the worst that can happen? He's like, okay, worst case scenario, either die the death or abjure forever the society of men. So she really has three options, right? First one, marry Demetrius. Second, or die. Third, become a nun. Stay a virgin the rest of your life. Because it's implied she's still a virgin. Right? Give up the society of men, and here he means men, males. He doesn't mean men, humankind. Male company. Give it up forever. Become a nun to Diana. Who's Diana? Goddess of chastity and virginity. So he says, line 68, know of your youth. Examine well your blood. Whether if you yield not to your father's choice, you can endure the livery of a nun. Okay? Examine well your blood. Your gloss tells you blood means passions. What's it really mean? Your youthful sexual desires. Come on, Hermia. She's late teens, probably. Maybe mid-teens. Can you really repress, you know, those hormones? She says, so will I. Grow, so live, so die. I will grow into this kind of person being what? For, give up all those desires. I will live that way the rest of my life. And I will die that way before what? 
before I give it up to him. Before I let Demetrius, she says, have my virgin patent. He said, whoa, 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 stop, stop, stop. You don't have to tell me now. He says, let's see. We'll give you some time to think about this. How about the next new moon, which happens to be when? His wedding day. So, on my wedding day to Hippolyta, queen of the Amazons, queen, in other words, of the defender of women's rights, okay, you will tell me whether you are going to marry Demetrius, a man you detest, die, or remain forever a virgin. You kind of think that might put a negative light on the whole wedding day festivities? Demetrius says, relent, sweet Hermia. Lysander, yield thy crazy right, uh, title, to my certain right. Lysander, you have her father, uh, Lysander says, you have her father's love, Demetrius. Let me have Hermia's. Do you marry him? That's a little bit of comic relief. Why? Because tension's building. I mean, we're now talking about the murder, the state execution of a young woman because she won't marry somebody her father wants her to marry. What has Lysander just introduced? You marry him. Okay. One thing you have to do with a play like Shakespeare, a writer like Shakespeare, or when we get to um, Sophocles in a couple of weeks, you can't read this play from the mindset of 2018 America. You have to try to put your 2018 mindset aside. Okay? And at the very least, you need to try to read it from the time in which it's written, mid-1590s England. Okay? And then, I would suggest, you should take one further step and try to read it from within the time frame in which it is set. Ancient Greece. Okay. Why? Well, there's a huge shift between ancient Greece, mid-1590s England, and another huge shift between mid-1590s England and today. Because today we would say, a father can't stop a daughter from marrying who she wants. Most people <coughs> say that. There might be some who would disagree. As the father of two daughters, I would probably disagree. But, but look at the difference between 1590s England and mythological Greece. I started by saying, what kind of rights do women have in ancient Greece? Zip. So that when he says... Your father's voice should be as a god to you. He means you do what he says, period. Is it the exact same way in mid-1590s England? Not quite, but yeah, it's pretty close. There's not a lot of difference there. But between then and today, there's a huge difference. Okay? So, when Lysander says... You have her father's love, Demetrius. Let me have hers. Do you marry him? What's he suggesting? Homosexuality, right? Man marry man. Big no-no. Right? In 1590s England, homosexuality is a capital crime. That is, to be an avowed open gay, modern termina terminology, you could be killed. You could be executed by the state. Okay? Ancient Greece? Nope. Homosexual homosexuality was open. It was accepted. I mean, that's what real love was thought of between males you only needed women to keep the race going, to keep the society going, okay? 
So, Aegean, scornful Lysander, in other words, bite your tongue, you know. You shouldn't talk like that. He hath my love, and what is mine, my love shall render him, etc., etc. So what does Lysander say? Notice, he doesn't respond to Aegeus. He turns to Theseus. I am my lord as well derived as he. What does he mean? My family name is as good as his family name. <clears throat> I'm a Vanderbilt. He's a Carnegie. I'm a Rothschild. He's a, you know, pick. I'm a Bush. He's a Kennedy. That's what he means. We can trace our lineage back the same amount. So, family name, his isn't any better than mine. What else? As well possessed. I've got as much stuff as he has. I'm as well off as he is. My love is more than his. That is, my love for Hermia is greater than his love. My fortune's every way as fairly ranked. The gloss for fairly says as handsomely. What does he mean by fortunes? He doesn't necessarily mean fortune, but it does imply wealth. Because he goes on and says, if not with vantage. Superior. If we were to pull out our bank statements, I'm actually a little better off than Demetrius is, if everything all tr you know, truth be told. So he says. Moreover, this is his, his coup de grace, his summation point. She loves me. What's he mean? That should count. Okay? So those are all his positives. Now he's going to strike a negative at Demetrius. What's the negative? He is false. He's a two-timer. He wooed Helena, Nader's daughter, and won her heart. He says she, uh, he may be loved to Nader's daughter, Helena. Doesn't mean he had sex with her. It means he won her heart. How? Probably by the exact same way Lysander did to Hermia. Wrote poems to her, sang songs to her, took her dinner, bought her cards, you know, the whole nine yards. Okay? Theseus, yeah, I heard about that. And I meant to have talked, but, you know, I've been a little bit preoccupied. So, Theseus says, Demetrius, Aegeus, come with me, we have some things to talk about. The implication is, Demetrius is going to get his you-know-what chewed out. Okay? So we're left with Lysander and Hermia on the stage. And what bright idea does Lysander come up with? He can run away. They can run away to his aunt's house. Where does she live? In the wood. Okay. Why is it significant that it's in the wood? What does he say cannot touch them there? Athenian law. All right, so we're introduced, verbally at least, to the second setting. The first setting is Athens. That's where law has power. That's where order is in control. That's where reason reigns supreme. The wood, just the opposite. It's not lawful, it's anarchy. It's not order, it's chaos. It's not reason. It's irrationality or foolishness. Okay? So he says, we can run off there, get married, and essentially live happily ever after. Notice, they can't go off, get married, and then come back to Athens. Because once they step back into Athens' territory, the law holds sway. So, Hermia agrees, and they talk a lot about, you know, love, and true lovers, and Shakespeare introduces that idea of star-crossed lovers, with line 150, if the true lovers have been ever crossed. And she goes on and says what? It stands as an edict in destiny. In other words, we're not the first ones to suffer this. She says it is a customary cross. We must learn patience, she says. 
We have to bear this cross. No. That Shakespeare put in quote unquote Christian language in a very pre Christian society. Okay? So that's when Lysander says, I haven't yet. She lives off in the woods. We'll go there. Helena comes in. And they talk to Helena. Hermia tells Helena what they're thinking of doing. She's like, okay. They, Hermia, Lysander leave, and Helen is left on stage. She gets a soliloquy. Not that it's any, any you know, deep, powerful, important soliloquy, but she's telling us what she's thinking. And she tells us, through Athens, I am thought as fair as she. That is, the common opinion in Athens is I'm as fair, as beautiful, as Hermia is. But what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. In other words, Athens can be 500,000 people. It doesn't matter. Demetrius doesn't agree. He will not know what all but he do know. He won't know. That is, he won't accept what everyone else thinks. He only thinks what he thinks. And as he errs, doting on Hermia's eyes, notice, she says, Demetrius isn't seeing correctly. Okay? He's seeing wrongly by doting on Hermia's eyes. So I, admiring of his qualities, things base and vile holding the quantity Love can transpose to form and dignity. What are the things that love transposes, changes into form and dignity? Things base and vile. Notice, currently, Demetrius errs by doting on Hermia's wife, eyes. Why? Because he thinks Hermia is the bee's knees. He thinks she's the most beautiful thing. But, Helena is getting at it. If Demetrius would see me the way the rest of Athens does, what would happen? I, who am now base and vile in his eyes, would be transposed to something of form and dignity. He would see me not as just the next door neighbor, but he would see me as the next, I don't know, swimsuit model. Why? What phrase do we still use today? Beauty is what? In the eye of the beholder. You've all known somebody, I think probably. If you haven't yet, you will by the time you're my age. Known of a couple, and one person of the couple is just gorgeous. Whether the man or woman, doesn't matter. And the other one, not so much. And people kind of go, how'd that happen? I mean, gorgeous. How'd this person luck out so much? Is it because this person, the gorgeous one, takes pity? No. It's because love, in the eye of the beholder, does what to the person loved. Beautifies that person. Okay? Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind, Helena says. And therefore is winged Cupid painted blind. Right? Because Cupid doesn't come after people going, he did. <laughs> and hit people with the arrow to make this person and this person fall in love. Nope. Cupid's more like Stevie Wonder with a bow and arrow. He's sitting here. And he'll... He just pulls. And where does the arrow go? 
In medieval literature, whenever you have someone who swears up and down, I'm a soldier. I ain't going to go for love. I'm never going to fall in love. Women make you weak need, not going to have anything to do with women. You can be damn sure that person is going to get nailed between the eyes, even though Cupid can't see him. Because whenever you make that kind of protest, you're always going down for a fall. Okay? So, she says, love doesn't look with the eyes, but with the mind. This is going to be important later on. Ere Demetrius looked on Hermia's eyne, plural for eyes, he hailed down oaths that he was only mine. He loved me first, is what she said. I'm going to tell him. I'm going to tell him what Hermia and Lysander are planning. Because then he'll do what? He'll run off into the wood. And I will follow him. Why? Does she think she's going to convert him to love her? Maybe. Why else, though? How many of you have ever, maybe go back to like grade school or junior high or something, you know, really liked somebody, but that other person didn't know you existed? It's another trope that you see throughout medieval and Renaissance love poetry. That other person doesn't know you exist, but you still want to do what? You still want to see that other person. Okay? So you work out ways so that you get into their presence. And they might not even, again, not even know you. So they don't really even look at you. They look right through you. Or maybe it's even the case, not where they don't know you, but they know you and they don't like you. But it still brings you some sick, twisted pleasure to be in their presence. That's hope. Because she's going to say, when she does go into the wood, following Demetrius, he's going to say, you know, you're a dog. And she's going to go, okay, I'll be your spaniel. What does she mean? Give me the words. I'll sit, I'll heal, I'll walk, I'll roll over, I'll... As long as I can be in your presence, hear your voice, see your face, etc. Okay? So... Second scene, still in Athens, okay? First scene has involved what layer, let's say, of society? What's Theseus? The rich. Yeah, top, the powerful, ruling class. I mean, Theseus is the dude. It's the highest level. Scene two, however, we get what level of society? Everyday working, Everyday working slots. These are blue collar, today we would call them blue collar workers. What's the difference between a blue collar worker and a white collar worker? I'm supposedly in a white collar class. It's the professional class, right? Why is it white collar? Why is it not? What does that blue collar mean in that phrase, blue collar worker? But no. Bingo. It's the uniform. It's the standard uniform. Mechanics, generally, especially if they're mechanics in a union, have union approved attire. You gotta wear it. If you go to work for, you know, I don't know, a um Bug spraying company. Every one of them, they have a uniform to wear. Okay? Might not be blue, but that's blue collar work. Why? Because you get your hands dirty. That's what ultimately it comes down to. Blue collar workers are people who work with their hands. These are all men who work with their hands. What kind of profession are they doing? Well, Peter Quint, the carpenter. So his hands. I'm a woodworker. So his hands are rough and calloused from working with saws and chisels and things like that all day. Snug the joiner. 
That is a very particular kind of carpentry. Carpenters generally build houses. Joiners generally build things like tables, and bookcases, and bookcases, and chairs, furniture makers. Bottom, the weaver. Okay. Weaves cloth. Flute, the bellows mender. The bellows that he mends are bellows for forges for smiths, for metal workers. Okay. Snout, the tinker. It's kind of a jack of all trades. He does a little bit of all of this. And then Starveling the tailor. He's probably got pinpricks in his fingers from when he forgets to use a thimble and he's sewing and such. Okay? Every one of them is characterized not by working with his mind daily, but with his hands. Okay? So why are they getting together? Louder. They're going to put on a play for the Duke's wedding. They hope. They're going to learn their parts. They're going to practice it. Do they know that they're going to do this play yet? No, we don't find that out until Act 5. They don't know that until Act 5. Right? So, we get introduced to the various characters, and we're told the parts they're going to play. Bottom is going to play the part of Pyramus. Notice, bottom and ass. Bottom ass. What appearance? Is he a tyrant or a lover? And he's told he's a lover who dies gallantly for love. He's like, cool, that's good. But I'd really like a tyrant. And he goes off on these lines. Okay, stops. Flute is named next. He says here, you're going to play the part of Thisbe. He says, ooh, what's Thisbe? A wandering knight? No, Thisbe is the woman that Pyramus falls in love with. No! Flute says, why? Why can't he play the part of a woman? And bear in mind, Shakespeare's day, all the women's parts were played by men. There are no women actors. Men meaning late teens, early 20s, as young as 11 or so. Okay. Well, Flute is one of those Late teens, early 20s, because he's getting a beard. Which could mean, you know, anywhere from he has a little beard to he's got four or five really good whiskers, you know. And he's like, no, I'm too old for this. You got to play. What does Bottom do? Ooh, I'll play Thisbe too. So I'll play Pyramus and Thisbe. Oh, Thisbe, my glove. Oh, Bottom. You know, like a one-man play. Then we're given the rest of the parts, and he volunteers to also play the part of the lion. What, what are we learning about Bottom? What kind of person is he? Likes attention. Likes attention. What else? You see the brains of the group? No. Not necessarily the dumbest one. But he is somewhat of a fool, or to use the term that gets used, he's an ass. He's kind of pompous. He, he, he strives for more than he's able to achieve. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't strive for beyond what we're able to achieve, but he has no hope of achieving the kind of stuff he thinks he can. Okay? It'd be like me saying, at 56, about eight surgeries on, you know, both sides of my knees, you know, I'm going to not only qualify to run the Boston Marathon, I used to run marathons, I'm going to win the Boston Marathon. Well, there ain't no way on God's green earth that I'm ever going to win the Boston Marathon. There ain't no way at this point in my life I'm ever going to run in the Boston Marathon. Okay? That's the kind of striving bot that that bottom is going for. So... We leave the wood, uh, we leave Athens, we come to Act 2. We're now in the wood. So, what no longer holds sway? What no longer controls? Well, there is no control. <laughs> Order out the window. Law out the window. Now we're in the realm of chaos. How do we know? We see two fairies come in. They talk a little bit. And the second fairy says to Puck, aren't you... Robin Goodfellow that 
merry wanderer of the night. And what does he say? Who likes to trick the milkmaids, etc., etc.? And Puck says, yep, that's me. What else? You, you're the one who likes to lead wanderers in the night astray to harm. See, Puck isn't an innocent prankster. The kind of pranks Puck can cause can lead people to injury and or death. Right? So, we'll stop there. Remember, for my two classes, we are now separate. Um, we'll pick up with when Oberon and Titania come in. Right? Like I said, I won't do a quiz on Friday, but there will be a quiz on Monday over the entire play. Right? Friday we'll probably get through Act 4, I think. Okay.